Hi, I'm Alex and this is Prosperous. Here we talk about some of the key building blocks to living a prosperous life. For this video, we will be talking about an important pillar of gaining control over your life. Specifically, how to get comfortable with making investment decisions over your hard earned capital, understanding investment risk, and managing yourself, your portfolio. This is a key life skill that can be learned, exercised, and brought into a simple periodic routine. Investing is said to require some level of discipline, but it'd be more helpful to think of it as adopting a process. The purpose of this video is to serve as a refresher on the basics and can be used to be reminded periodically of a few core lessons. This is a good habit even when things are good, not just in tough times. Some of these lessons come from existing work in game theory, statistics, and other more advanced disciplines, but can be kept to a relatively simple level in order to be actually useful day to day. These lessons may also be worth thinking about in other areas of your life, specifically where you invest your time, attention, relationship efforts, all which involve effort and risk. These pointers may also be helpful to you at all levels where you're starting a business or putting money aside for a graphics card. One of the most frustrating aspects of the last 20 years is a new need to become actively responsible for maintaining the value of your savings over time. For many years before, putting money into a savings account or paying down a house mortgage was a tried and true way to build savings safe from external risk. This is sadly no longer available as inflation, technology, politics, and even pandemics have made the old trusted tools obsolete. This forces onto each one of us a central role in managing our nest egg. Today, we discuss six core aspects of how to build a personal process of investing for your future. At the end, we'll also discuss three strategies you can use right away to get you started in thinking in new ways. With this out of the way, let's dive in. The important first decision to make is how involved do you want to be in the process of managing your investments. You may have come to the conclusion that you need to understand and control your financial future. Certainly investing and understanding risk is not something which is broadly taught in school, which makes the whole topic uncomfortable to many. Others also consider it too complicated or too emotionally stressful. Often the core issue is an aversion to uncertainty. Many prefer to stay away from things that they cannot control directly. Yet handing over portfolio to a mutual fund manager or financial advisor may only provide an illusion of control, or perhaps at most a buffer for emotions. Something or someone to be angry at bad times. So why consider making investment decisions yourself? Well, it can be very empowered to be in control of your financial future. Financial comfort is key to accomplishing some key life goals of personal independence. Once you've decided you want to do this yourself, the next question or where to start and how much time do you want to spend thinking about this as it does require some routine maintenance work. This will determine how deep and how many instruments you will manage, learn about and ultimately make decisions upon. Indeed, you can get started with very few. Initially as simple as cash and a broad-based exchange traded fund like the S&P 500 and work up over time and complexity from there. The idea is to start small and be comfortable at every step, not overwhelmed. You will learn from every action, even from mistakes, and develop a personal sense of decision-making under uncertainty. What's nice is that you can stop at whatever level of complication you get comfortable with or keep learning. It's your choice. Assuming the overall answer is your intent on spending some time, but not too much, let's press on. What is an investment? An investment is basically a story you decide to buy into with money. It can be a very simple and straightforward story, such as when you lend a bank your money through a savings account. Most are more complicated. For each investment, you need to have a reason to believe in the story, what is generally called a thesis. This can be as simple as you use and like the product, and after looking at the company, you think it's a good buy. 
It should likely be more than following a friend into the unknown. A thesis can be solid, well-researched, and wrong. Another can be superficial, based on hearsay, and still make you money. The key point here is you can't delegate the thinking. You need to make up your own opinion. Knowing that the decision to make the investment was yours can help. Knowing your own level of conviction and how it may vary over time can help you to learn and also understand your mistakes. More on that later. Also, try to look for longer term stories, those that can play out and grow over many years. You need to periodically check on developments to evaluate if the initial reasons for having the invested are still valid. What you're trying to avoid, which is a very common mistake, is to look at an existing investment and forget why you're still in it. Once you think of each investment as a story, it becomes easier to make up your mind if you still believe in it and how the story develops over time and what to do with your investment. Understanding Cycles Yet before we start picking individual stories, it's important to understand the cyclical nature of markets. Like seasons or phases of the moon, markets develop natural cycles, even if they aren't always evident at the time. This is primarily due to crowd psychology and two main emotions all markets follow, fear and greed. Many clues exist that can help you figure this out, and some propose there are four distinct phases of this cycle when it comes to investment markets. The holy hell phase. Otherwise called as the markdown phase, this is a painful time for investors who still hold equities. Stocks are falling consistently, and small problems cause major price drops as many investors exit stories they no longer believe in. Yet, after the selling has been exhausted, comes the start of a new accumulation phase. Second, the dip my toe phase. The accumulating begins when morale hits its lowest point. Value investors, money managers, and experienced traders begin buying shares after they believe the worst is gone, and the values become critically important. The market attitude shifts from negative to neutral throughout this time frame, and the volumes remain low. Third, the catch-up phase. During the markup phase, larger investors begin to pour in big amounts of money, resulting in significant increase in market volume. While stock prices begin to rise above historical norms, unemployment and layoffs continue to rise. At the markup stage, market moods shift from neutral to positive and in some circumstances exuberant. Due to the participation of fence sitters and the hesitancy of risk adverse investors, a selling climax is witnessed. Finally, the euphoria stage. This is a time when everyone at every social occasion is talking to you about their favorite investment. At this point, you should be feeling like you're missing the boat and everyone else is a genius. Yet because expectations are so high, a sudden negative geopolitical change or bad economic news can cause a lot of harm. What you should likely be doing, however, is sell off and raise some cash for the game to begin again. Knowing which phase the market is in is your first homework. It will tell you what general themes to follow. Should you be picking up the best of what's gotten beaten up or should you be putting aside reserves for the coming winter? Keep in mind that cycles seem to be getting shorter and shorter as industry, technology, product, and career cycles shrink. Thinking in cycles also reminds you that, like always, this too shall pass. Four, expectations. Managing your expectations when making investment is difficult but important. At its most basic, as an investor, you can invest with firm or solid expectations, but have a chance to be negatively surprised. This is how you should think of bonds, loans, savings accounts. Here, if everything goes according to plan, you know from the start where you should end up. What you're looking for there are signs that something may break. You can also invest with low certainty or contained expectations maybe, and have a chance to be positively surprised. This is what equity investing is all about. Whether investing in early stage company or publicly traded stock, as an equity investor, you come at the end of a very long list of people, customers, employees, creditors, tax collectors, before you benefit. 
you should temper your expectations accordingly. Third, do nothing. This is quite underrated, as there are times when nothing looks attractive and the urge to put money to work can push you into bending your own rules. Be careful. As you become a more experienced investor, more choices open up with many more products like private equity, hedge funds, venture funds, early stage investments. Nevertheless, this breakdown still applies. Managing expectation is key to gaining comfort and conviction in making investing choices. Expectations should ideally be based on your belief in the story and not be influenced by price movements. Five, understanding risk. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is to take on too much risk. Surprisingly, the second biggest may be taking on too little. Call it the Goldilocks problem. If we go back to the idea of a story, risk can be thought as how uncertain the outcome of that story you buy into is likely to be. It's important to know what kind of uncertainty you are willing to live with. Some don't accept any uncertainty in their lives, and those are unlikely to want it in their investments. For the rest of us, we need to get comfortable with evaluating and managing different components of risks. Let's go through all these risks so we understand them. First, market risk. We've talked about the cycle, but market risk is basically the fact that you're a small fish in a very large sea and that you're going to be tossed around. You need to be comfortable with understanding where the cycle is, and you need to understand that you're unlikely to influence the outcome here. You are trying to look for opportunities. Inflation risk. Here, and particularly lately, you see the erosion that is caused by time and your savings when you keep them in cash. Interest rate risk. This is the risk that lower risk investments like bonds will outcompete yours by being relatively more attractive if rates rise. As interest rates go up, more people are able to earn higher returns out of more simple investments like mortgages or bonds, and those may compete with your investments. Living in an era of very low rates, this is a risk that a lot of people are worried about. But there are also more subjective risks. First, the emotional risk. The risk of your action may be influenced by outside events or your reaction to them. Liquidity risk. The risk that you may need to use your safe capital and need to exit investments, such as, for example, looming in retirement. Over time, you will find out what kind of investor you are and what kind and level of uncertainty you're willing to accept. The key is to start small and to go up in risk slowly as you get comfortable with each of the components at each step. Maybe don't start with crypto altcoins and naked options writing. This is more art than science for most, but you can learn to be better at it, particularly from your mistakes. One useful way to think of losses is as paying as little as you can for new information and learning. Six, portfolio construction. Now that you have some risk on the books, it's time to manage it. Not thinking of your total portfolio risk profile as you add investments is your next mistake to avoid. Usually, an unattended portfolio gets disorganized and sloppy over time. As prices move and things change, what was semi-organized before becomes messy and cleaning up is never fun. This is where the routine part comes in even if it doesn't have to be time consuming. Even an hour a week diving back into individual stories can immensely help having an incremental view of your portfolio. Read some articles about your favorite stories, develop a sense of how you think these theses are going. Portfolio construction is about two key elements, keeping risk under control, and as importantly, making sure that you match your upside potential where you're taking risk. Part of the earlier discussion was thinking of risk in buckets. Portfolio construction is about picking and sizing these buckets of possible upside and corresponding risk relative to each other. The idea is to achieve, on average and in the aggregate, a desired risk and reward profile. To take risk where you think you're going to get the highest return. Think of it this way. 
In order for your overall risk to be managed, you can have different parts of your portfolio hold assets which behave somewhat differently. At its simplest, think of owning cash, whose value only gets affected by inflation, and the overall stock market through, for example, an exchange-traded fund. You now have two buckets to think about. If you want your market risk to be lower, you add to cash. If you want your inflation risk to be lower, you buy more of the overall market. Over time, as you get comfortable, you can start adding more buckets. In the low-risk category, you can consider money market funds, bank deposit, and possibly Bitcoin, all the way to dividend-paying stocks. On the riskier side, the sky is the limit, but common areas include technology stocks, other growth equities, foreign stocks, and private equity. As time goes by, the value of your position will move up and down, and this balance will get out of line. You can have what used to be a small position grow very large, or a broken position get very small. The solution is usually to rebalance, meaning buy more of some and sell some of the other, to reflect your updated opinion on every story you own, or a change in the cycle as we discussed before. Having stocks in your portfolio you no longer understand can be a signal to learn a lesson, sell, and move on. Acknowledging you are wrong is very difficult for any of us to do, but it's also one of the most important tools in learning and growing as an investor. As an individual, you also need to keep taxes in mind. In the US and in many countries, any gains you make holding assets over one year can be taxed at a lower rate. Keeping tabs on your holding periods can be helpful, just as rebalancing too often can create tax liabilities that can eat into your long-term returns. Similarly, selling off losing position at the end of the year can help you reduce your taxes and is called tax loss harvesting. One helpful approach is to trade around your position in your IRA or tax advantage accounts, adding more when it feels cheaper selling some of your position when it jumps up. There you can be more free to move in and out of position and you don't have to worry about capital gains or holding periods. In summary, the best way to think of portfolio construction and management is to develop an understanding of how much you invest in each category and individual asset, and how it influences your risk and growth potential in the overall portfolio. It helps you make less last minute emotional decisions and live with the bumps along the way. As always, we will discuss three things you can try right now and see if they work for you. A. Start with barbells. Let's go back to buckets. Once you understand your comfort with risk, you can start determining your first two buckets of risk. One very low risk and one higher risk. It's sometimes called a barbell strategy. Buckets can be as simple as cash in the bank or an exchange traded fund like the S&P 500 as we discussed earlier, but can also include technology stocks, precious metals like gold, commodity, or energy. The idea of a barbell is to start with two simple choices, the most and least risky buckets you are getting to know and learn how to use them before taking on too many positions. Later, you can refine and create more buckets as you refine your degrees of risk appetite and new opportunities open up. Many who have already have a portfolio created by others without a systematic approach have gone back to barbells as a first step. Start simple, start small, hold two things in your head, get comfortable, stabilize, then move on from there. If you ever decide this is not for you, this is the best place to quit from. B. Incrementalism, not radicalism. Most time in investing, it's not helpful to think in absolutes. In other words, going back and forth between being all in and all out can be nerve wracking, exhausting and damaging. The idea here is to work slowly and starting up and maybe also leaving a position. Maybe people think they need to time their investment decisions very precisely, for example, around earnings announcements. Sometimes when markets move irrationally, it can be done opportunistically. But most often, and certainly in the beginning, one of the easiest ways to manage risk is to take your time buying into a desired investment and similarly sell undesired position over a period of time. This is sometimes called dollar cost averaging, but think of it as implementing decision more slowly, which is another way to reduce your risk involved in your actions. Maybe you want to buy a stock because of your long-term belief in it, but you're afraid that it's quite volatile. 
Here, the idea is to buy whatever total intended exposure a little at a time, maybe over weeks, if not months. Another way to look at incrementalism is to move partially between one position and another. Is it time to take 20% off this position in energy and add to beaten down technology stocks? The idea is not to move fast as much as it is to steer a ship methodically, incrementally, representing your best thinking of the current conditions and the risks ahead and growth potential. When working in and out of positions incrementally, it's often more comfortable to look back at your past actions as you're much less likely to have timed anything perfectly, but also horribly. Finally, contrarian thinking. Here's something to get more comfortable over time as an investor. Very often we are conditioned to follow what everybody else is doing. In investing, this is called momentum or otherwise not fighting the trend. While this is generally a reasonable benchmark for one not to do, it's not a particularly good guide as to what to actually invest in. At many points in the last 15 years, you could have looked at your Apple iPhone and decided it was going to succeed. Get in touch with that feeling that you had when you discovered a new product or an app on your phone. Try to determine what is it about what you do every day that gives you a special insight into an industry or any product. Then, as you see the market have a contrary view to yours, or perhaps it's not understanding yet something you've already figured out, think about taking a position. Often you can find a company, a stock, a product, which not everybody knows about yet, or more often has given up on because of a bad quarter or a bad earnings release. Again, first has to be the insight, the conviction in the thesis. But most often, the best long-term investments come from seeing things in a different way from others. Warren Buffett, a legendary American investor, quoting his teacher Ben Graham, likens the stock market to a hyperactive, manic-depressive individual he names Mr. Market, prone to fits of hysteria and irrationality. I find this analogy helpful in breaking down the taboo of thinking that you cannot possibly be right, holding an opposite position to the norm. If you made it this far, I want to say thank you for listening, and please get in touch if anything sparks a thought or a question. Be well.